Uh, at the outset of this panel, I spoke about the importance of civil society organizations and the important role that they play in defending human rights and in upholding and protecting democracy and real democracy, not just lip service to democracy, democratic uh, processes. And I think both of uh, our speakers, Pavel and Amr, have uh, demonstrated um, the importance of that with their country-specific examples. And I think we also need to commend them for the circumstances in which they work and in which they courageously carry out their work. And um, just some of the themes that seem to run across the board is the uh, the um, use of legislation to create obstacles to freedom of association, restrictions on funding, the de the, de the criminalization, let's say, of legitimate behavior, and um, constraints upon uh, rights and freedoms, including freedom of expression and freedom of association. And also, I think in both contexts, uh, both in country examples, the wielding of ideologies to um, shift power balances and not in a good way. And I, I thought it was particularly interesting as well, um, uh, aside from some of the trends that we maybe could have predicted, uh, sadly, uh, with respect to the foreign agent law and other um, uh, uh, um, uh, xenophobic trends, you might say. Um, it was interesting as well, some of the lessons for civil society organizations ourselves. We all have a stake in what happens in other regions, particularly when it comes to upholding democracy. A threat to democracy uh, in any country is a threat to democracy everywhere, in my view. And uh, it was also interesting to hear uh, Amir's um, third section of your talk and the lessons for civil society organizations ourselves and the false dichotomies that we ourselves can sometimes uh, propagate gate, such as between um, civil and political rights and economic, social, and cultural rights, and how important all of these rights are to real democracy and meaningful participation by individuals in furthering democracy. So having said that, I would like to open up the floor to questions if there are any. And uh, I see some hands. If there's only one, I would invite you to uh, please use the mic. If there's more than one, um, what we would like to do is ask all of the, we, we have time for maybe three questions, and we would ask for everybody to ask their questions of the panelists, and then we'll give a few minutes to the panelists to respond to all of the questions. Um, so far, I see one hand, so go ahead. Thank you. It's, I'm Peter Molnar from CU and Radio Tilos, Radio Forbidden here in Hungary. And it's also a question connected to the previous panel, but uh, especially by the Egyptian example, it seems to me that there may be an interesting comparative difference that in Egypt, the human rights uh, civil society activists uh, are up for uh, joining political opposition in sense of creating a political alternative to to suppression, suppressive, more suppressive uh, political parties. While, uh, for example, in Hungary, uh, there are such attempts, but civil society and and civil liberties organizations, uh, at least sometimes, seems to define seem to define uh, themselves uh, against the political establishment against the political parties against those who exercise power against professional politicians which i think is related to what istvan rave mentioned on how the rhetoric and agenda of civil liberties organizations and radical right wing can surprisingly be seemingly similar at some issues, and it seems to be a trap for civil liberties organizations to sort of question uh, or, or even attack the so-called political establishment as necessarily wrong, as necessarily corrupt, with all the, all the justifiable and, and right skepticism about whether people can survive corruption in power, but how, so the question is that uh, how do you see this uh, this comparative difference that that uh, uh, and and how those civil liberties organizations which which are kind of 
distancing themselves from professional politics can reconcile this uh, rhetoric with a stand for parliamentary democracy, which is still based on parties. Thanks. All right. Uh, of course, I cannot talk on, on behalf of the Hungarian and the Hungarian colleagues. I, mean, I would like to learn from their experience, from their experience more. But, but le let me try to clarify my my idea about about transgressing the boundaries between the sphere of politics and the sphere of the civil society activism. I didn't mean that civil society organization has to replace the political parties. And political parties, they have one function that nobody else can actually play that is competing for power. Simple. And civil society organization will never do that. We will never run for office. We are experts at the end of the day, even the volunteers, but we will never run for office. This is one major dividing line that shouldn't be transgressed, that it is healthy to keep. It is very healthy to keep. But what I mean is that we can, for example, have kind of exper experimenting building local firms in order to advance a specific legislation. We have now a very interesting campaign for a new labor law. And we are waiting for the new, for the new parliament for a new labor law. And this one is initiated basically by a number of the civil society organization and some independent trade union activists because simply they are the one who are familiar with the know-how, with the technicality of the thing. We drafted the legislation. And then we asked the different political parties to join us and to form a coalition. And this coalition will be the one that will try to advance and lobby the new parliament in order to advance this kind of progressive, social-oriented new labor law. This is the kind of experiments that I mean. It's building, building front and building front on the local level. We had a very similar, very similar success story, actually, I would say, uh, in 2007 even before the revolution, even before the revolution, 2007, that's called the Committee for the Health Rights. The popular, it was exactly, the popular Committee for the Health Rights. At that time, there was a bill, a new health insurance bill that was suggested by the last government of Mubarak, and this is again informed by neoliberal model, and it would have infringed on the, uh, on the health insurance safeguards. And again, the ones that detected the problem, the ones that detected the problem were independent health rights activists, doctors. So they liaised with us in the EIPR, at the EIPR, with our program on the right to health, and then we took it forward, we studied the bill, and we prepared a study to show how it is catastrophic and how it will actually violate the major safeguards of the, of the right to health, etc., etc. And then we went to some of the political forces at that time. Many of them were outlawed at that time, before, before the revolution. And we built that committee. And that committee, it had members of the parliament, it had members from the political parties, it had us, and it has those independent activists. And definitely, definitely, and by default, right-wingers didn't join. Because this is, by default, goes against their own bill. Yeah? And that was, again, another success story because we managed to block that bill at the state council. And we turned it down. We had, we had a court ruling in 2008 that cancelled the, uh, the decree by the prime minister. This is the kind of coalition that I mean. Yeah, not that we will replace the political organization because we are not going to compete for power. And actually, it is unhealthy for a human rights activist to reincarnate himself or herself as a political activist. This is an unhealthy thing. An unhealthy thing. A, political, a human rights activist has to stay far from power, far from political power, but he shouldn't shy away from the political sphere. This is what I meant. I would add just a couple of words. Um, the main feature in uh, Russian politics right now is <clears throat> uh, no trust to any institutions. So any institutions uh, have been uh, discredited. Uh, no tr public trust, no public trust for uh, to parliament, to courts, to political parties. Uh, uh, according to last week survey, nation, nationwide survey, uh, six, more than 60% of Russians uh, uh, doesn't, doesn't know why they need political parties. So uh, uh, the thing is that the only the only institution uh, uh, which uh, gains uh, 
83% of public support is the president and only while Putin is a president. So this is not a support to the institution, this is support to personality. And that th uh, that's why <clears throat> there is no even talks about uh, participation in any political activity because political activity uh, is, uh, there is no trust of political activity, the formal one, but informal political activity, the streets, in the internet, all this criticism and protests have been already criminalized. So that's, uh, civil society institutions are not competing t uh, with political party at all. And I would say that this is the, the main distrust and uh, that, that we were talking about in the first panel is uh, right uh, about uh, nowadays Russia. Thank you. Question? Okay. So my question concerns something that Pavel said about taking as many uh, cases to the court as possible. But, uh, and excuse me if I will oversimplify your strategy. Uh, but actually I would like to hear both of your comments. So you said that you, your aim was taking as many cases to the Russian courts as possible and out of 20, you actually won 60 and that you consider a success. And some could say that um, using uh, an undemocratic or a semi-democratic system, even the, uh, the legislative system and the jurisdiction and so on, um, it would uh, legitimize the system and it might not be the best strategy if you want to uh, tackle or, or fight against the system as a whole in its whole being undemocratic. Uh, and so on, and I would be really interested in your comments. Uh, you're absolutely right, uh, and uh, well, I should I should also notice that I am a member of the Presidential Council for Human Rights in Russia. So, uh, so, so I am I, I am a member of a council that uh, supposed to give certain advices uh, about human rights to President Putin, uh, and and I all and I often uh, hear these uh, questions uh, that uh, we uh, participating in in such institutions are really. Uh, actually legitimize uh, uh, the uh, authorities. But the thing is that we are lawyers, I am a lawyer, and, uh, and, and our organization is a legal uh, organization, and lawyers cannot uh, act outside the legislation and outside uh, courts. I mean, the only, the only alternative to that is uh, Maidan like in Kiev uh, or or Egyptian revolution uh, uh, or 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 any uh, such types of violent uh, opposition to uh, to the government uh, for <clears throat> uh, I, I I don't think that this uh, is this option is on the agenda in in Russia right now. Uh, uh, this is the first message, and the second uh, is uh, still we, uh, according to our professional uh, skills, we we have to use uh, these uh, these institutions, these court uh, 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 courts, uh, 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 until uh, we uh, can uh, win at least one case. Uh, and uh, I all all often cite Yosef Brodsky, who is a Nobel, Nobel Prize uh, laureate, uh, and, uh, on his speech, and he said, uh, it was in early 80s, I guess, uh, he said that uh, probably we won't be able to save the world, but we always can save an individual. So we are trying to use this strategy and we are trying to, to help a particular organizations and particular people until we can do that. So that's, that's Thank it. Thank you. Uh, there's one more question. Uh, thank you very much for both presentation were uh, very, very interesting. Arm, I have a question. Uh, I was uh, I very surprised about the, I mean, the similarities between your analysis about Egypt and some situations in Latin America, particularly uh, about this uh, dichotomy between liberal democracies and social democracies. Uh, 
that this is the kind of division and and actually and and also the need for the civil society and particular human rights organization to cross those boundaries and not just being a part just making analysis and 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 fact finding mission in order to denounce human rights violations but also just uh, make alliances with the grassroots. My question is, uh, I mean, in, in Latin America, I mean, I can think in Venezuela, Ecuador, or many other countries in which uh, these are the problem, the, the, like the governments with strong popular support, because particularly they address good or bad, but they address social agenda, uh, also, they have a, a, a they have a, a, a like measures that are uh, reducing democratic spaces. Uh, but they are have more than 60, 70 percent of support. My question is: we we know that the international uh, arena and international strategies play a strong or can play a strong influence in order to can kind of, I mean, to influence this kind of national dynamics in our regions. But the problem is that we, at least from a Latin American perspective, we deal with is the analysis that you have made is very difficult to have at the international level, either for the international media or either, I mean, that's nuances that <laughs> you have portrayed or sometimes for international Human rights organizations. I mean, I, I think I, I think some, that sometimes we are, uh, or some organizations are, are having in mind the the more traditional model of analysis. So, how do you see? How can you? I mean, how can you? Or how do you see? How will be the uh, a helpful idea of agenda of work to connect that analysis and that that you portray for, for Egypt with the international actors in order for them to have a better, uh, a, a much more nuances diagnosis and, and, and then uh, do a much better work in order to influence and connect with the national actors, not only human rights, but also grassroots, uh, I mean, as a, as a piece of that puzzle. Uh, I don't know if I was clear. Well, right, th thanks for the question. It's very, it's very helpful. But, but actually, this is the one million dollar question. I mean, and I don't think that there's anyone who has kind of a, a very, a very ready-made answer for that. But, but at least this is, let's say, that this is the question that we are all facing in many different, in many different contexts. Yeah. One thing that I, that I would say that this is actually the role of transnational networks like ours. And this is one of the beauties about the transnational, the transnational activism that's trying to connect different social movement and civil society organizations from different contexts in the north and the south, so they can target specific specific agenda that affecting them both at the same at the same at the same time. For example, in Egypt, there is now an ongoing, very interesting struggle about the coal. About the uh, because I mean, there's there's a energy crisis power crisis. I mean, this is a global one. Electricity in Egypt affects basically the electricity, and we need to enhance the ability of the electricity plants in Egypt in order to, to I mean, address this, this crisis. I mean, you have nuclear, which is very dangerous. Nobody is actually want to take that, take that risk in a country like Egypt. I mean, nobody wants another Chernobyl, which is very possible in Egypt, of course. I mean, given, given the political disarray and the, the technical failure. So they will opt for the coal. Yeah, I mean, importing the coal and then starting feeding the, 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 the electricity plants with the coal. But this is, I mean, polluting, destructive, of the environment, big time, destructive of the life of many different local local communities, whereby the coal will be used in their own surroundings, and this will lead to kind of a mass eviction of of actually specific places in order to establish these plants, because nobody actually can live next to a plant that is run by coal. This is one struggle that we are engaged in. Our, my organization is part of. Again, we are trying to build 
a coalition that has some political parties, some political activists on board. But for this coalition, for example, to succeed, it has to liaise with others in the north, in the global north. No way. No way for this coalition to succeed without liaising with the north. I mean, the struggle against the Siemens factories. I mean, I remember in 2007, 2006, there was a case about the cement factory that is part of a Spanish group that's using the asbestos. And the asbestos, again, it causes lung cancer and many other, and many other diseases. And that was prohibited to be established in Spain. So the thing was kind of exported to one of the third world country, global south country, and then it was erected in Egypt with all the asbestos. It was impossible for us to win this case, and we closed down that planet, without the solidarity of social movement in Spain and in Europe, and across Europe. And we liaised with something like the Economic and Social Commission in the European Union, and a bunch of social activists in, in Europe, and many others. So this question, actually, is a question for the North-South transnational networks, like INCLU. It's like, how can we have kind of a carefully selected objective, carefully selected cases, three, four cases that we want to win, that we want to target and have something like success stories about, and, and, and naturally, naturally there will be an economic and social area, yeah, apart from migration and many others. That was, this is something on our agenda and how we can interfere with these policies in order to change the international framework in such a way that can affect our own local polity in much more, uh, in a much more healthy, in a much more healthy way. And this is one of the reasons that we are here and one of the reasons that we are interested to be part of these, of these networks and to come to Europe and to convey our message. I'm not sure if this answers your question, but again, the, I mean, we, we, we are going to answer this via struggle. I mean, there is no question. Okay, so I would like to ask you to join me in thanking our excellent panelists for their excellent presentation. So. And I would, also, <clears throat> I would also very much like to thank uh, INCLO and uh, in particular the HCLU, Stefania, and all of your colleagues for uh, your excellent organization and uh, hospitality. Thank you so much.